Almost a year before his death, Johnny Cash, at the age of 70, would gain a younger generation of fans by covering Nine Inch Nails' 1994 song, Hurt. But how did he end up covering that song? It seems like a strange choice, but also a very appropriate song given that time in his life. What's beautiful about the song is that it takes on an entirely different meaning based on who's singing it. And Trent Reznor's intention was to have the song about a young person spiral into either self-harm or drug addiction, but Cash gives the song a new light. Cash interpreted the lyrics to be about an older man who knew his life was about to be over. And prior to recording and releasing Hurt in 2002, Cash, of course, had a long and storied career. Born in Arkansas in 1932, he would sign his first major record deal in the mid-50s to Sun Records, and he would soon establish himself as one of the greatest country and rock singers of all time, with classics like I Walk the Line and Ring of Fire. And Johnny Cash was the rock and roll rebel as he was given the name The Man in Black, not just because of his fashion, but because of his outlaw image. By the later part of his career, in the 70s and 80s, Cash had expanded beyond music, appearing in both television and film. But as the 90s began, the music industry saw a dramatic shift as alternative rock is what the record labels were interested in. And while a lot of alternative bands had their roots in punk, those same artists paid tribute to Cash. Cash would team up with Nirvana bassist Chris Novoselic to do a Willie Nelson tribute album, and would also appear on the U2 album 1993's Europa on the song Wanderer. It was that appearance and his appearance at a Bob Dylan tribute show in 1992 that got him the attention of big time producer Rick Rubin. Rubin at that point in his career had a record label named American Recordings which used to be called Deaf American and he was scouting for acts to add to his growing roster. Rubin felt that Cash was still an important figure in music who had been treated unfairly by the industry. Now it seemed like an odd choice for Rubin's label given his past roster of clients but then again, Rubin has worked with an eclectic group of artists, including the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Beastie Boys, Run DMC, and Slayer. And Rubin would offer Cash something he offers all his artists, creative freedom. Here's Cash discussing how he initially first met Rick Rubin and how he wasn't interested in even speaking with him. How did, how did uh, he come to, how did he approach you to be on his label? I was doing a show in California, and um, when I came off stage, my manager, Lou Robin, came to me and said, there's a man here named Rick Rubin that said he would like to meet you that uh, has a record company and he would like to record you. And I said, uh, I don't want to meet him. <laughs> and he said, yeah, what, uh, I think he might like him. I said, why? And he said, well, he's different. He's not yeah. like the rest of them. So true. And uh, so I, I told him, bring him back. And so I went back and there's Rick and... Uh, Immediately I liked him. Mm -hmm. And I said, so if you had me on your record label, what would you do that nobody else has done? And he said, what I would do is let you sit down before a microphone with your guitar and sing every song you want to record. <laughs> Just you and your guitar. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're talking about a dream I had a long time ago to do, a, do an album called Late and Alone. <laughs> and uh, he said, that's it. He said, that's the kind of record that we want to make. Well, that was my first, uh, first uh, American record. Uh -huh. Cash would sign with Rick Rubin's record label, but a lot of people upon hearing the news were confused and even a little weary, including Cash's own daughter, as exemplified by this interview. Yeah, I'd heard of Slayer before, but you know, the thing that intrigued me that the men that produced the rap music and, and the Chili Peppers and Slayer and all of them was interested in me personally. The opportunity of, of working with someone like him really excited me, so I tracked him down and we spent some time together. I went to see a couple of his shows and um, we started hanging out a bit and talking about music. Shortly before that, Dad had been asked to do the Lollapalooza tour, and I called him up to please don't do it, Dad. Just don't. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're not going to get the respect you deserve. I just couldn't bear to think about him going out and playing to 14-year-olds who didn't know or care who he was. So when I heard about Rick, I probably definitely had a few of those concerns. Like, does this guy really get who he is? It's given me an opportunity to uh, express myself artistically that I never had before. I've drug out every old song that I ever wanted to sing 
and and I've sung them. The Tennessee stud was long and lean, the color of the sun and his eyes were green. It's given me an enthusiasm and a, and a new uh, look at what I, what my possibilities and capabilities are that I never thought I would get to experience. Some of the songs I really didn't understand why he was doing them or why Rick chose them. It was a matter of getting used to a, a new Johnny Cash on record. The first album he would put out on Rubin's label would be called American Recordings and would see its release in 1994. The album would feature songs written by Cash himself, plus songs by Tom Waits and Leonard Cohen. The album was well received by critics and would end up earning Cash some of the best reviews of his career. And Cash and Rubin followed up American Recordings with Unchained in 1996, and that album would feature covers of Beck, Soundgarden, and Tom Petty. And the album would get a Grammy nomination for Best Country Album. Unchained in 1996 would be followed up four years later with 2000's Solitary Man, which saw Cash cover U2 song 1. All the cover songs Cash recorded would soon pave the way for him covering Nine Inch Nails' single, Hurt. His final album of his career would be late 2002's American 4, The Man Comes Around. And of course, it was Rick Rubin's idea to have Cash cover the Nine Inch Nails track. Trent Reznor was a personal friend of Rubin, so when Rubin asked Reznor if Cash could cover a song, he said he was both flattered but also skeptical thinking the idea sounded gimmicky. But Reznor agreed. But his opinion on the matter would soon change, especially after seeing the music video. And Cash also made some minor changes to the lyrics, substituting Crown of Thorns instead of the original lyrics, which had Crown of Shit. Now, Crown of Thorns was used by Nine Inch Nails in the radio edit of the song. Rubin had previously brought the song to the attention of Cash, but the country singer had trouble understanding the lyrics with Rubin telling Rolling Stone, I think it was hard for him to hear it. So I sent him the lyrics and I said, just read the lyrics. If you like the lyrics, then you'll find a way to do what that will suit you. And Cash trusted Rubin's insistence to have the song recorded, and it was laid down at Rubin's house in Los Angeles. It was, very emo it was a very emotional video. I mean, did you feel very emotional I did. doing it? I did. I felt very emotionally emotional doing the Hurt video, yes. Did you, where did the song come from? Did, you, did Rick Rubin play it for you and say, we're going to do this song? Yeah. Uh, what did you think when you first heard it? Yeah, Rick played the song for me, and I, uh, I, when I heard the record, I said, I can't do that song, it's not my style. Yeah. It just, he said, well, let's try it another way, let me do something. Mm -hmm. So he put down a track, and I listened to it. So we started working on that. From, from there, we started working on it until uh, we got the record made. Now, at this point in Cash's life, his health was seriously deteriorating, and this affected his voice. Rubin would tell Rolling Stone in the same interview, there were times when his voice sounded broken. He tried to turn that into a positive in the selection of the music. It was a real struggle for him. Now the video for the song was also very memorable and was shot on a cold winter's day in Nashville in February of 2003. It would be movie director Mark Romanak who shot the video, and his previous credits included artists such as Madonna, Beck, and Lenny Kravitz and Romanak had been begging Rubin for a chance to work with Johnny Cash for quite a while. Romanak's goal was to capture who Cash was, splicing images of a young cocky rebel with a frail old man that appeared to be at the end of his life. A lot of the footage was shot at the House of Cash Museum in Nashville, which by this point in time was in a pretty bad state of disrepair as shown in the video. The shots of decaying fruit and the museum would serve as a metaphor for Cash's own health and the building would unfortunately be destroyed in 2007 by an accidental fire. Now, several months after the video was shot, his wife of 35 years, June Carter Cash, passed away, and Johnny Cash would pass away several months later in September of 2003. Johnny Cash's final album would prove to be an amazing farewell for the legendary musician, as the album was the first Johnny Cash record to achieve gold in the U.S. in more than three decades. So the question has to be asked, how did Trent Reznor feel about the whole thing now looking back? Well, here's what he had to say about the song. He just called me up and said, um, you know, we're, we're doing another record with Johnny and we'd like to do Hurt. Are you okay with that? And I said, of course. Right. I'm extremely flattered that Johnny Cash, who I consider an unbelievable songwriter, would mm -hmm. want to cover one of my songs. Yeah, of course. And, and I think just to justify my sense of not being that important in my own head. And I thought, well, they're probably doing, you know, 50 cover songs, you know. And we, we were in the midst of working on something at the same time. I was in New Orleans at the mm -hmm. time. 
And then um, a couple weeks later, a CD shows up in the mail, and we listen to it. And, you know, it was very strange, you know, hearing his giant voice yes. inhabiting the song that I wrote, you know, kind of taken over. But it was so weird at that moment that, uh, I, it, you know, it felt so wrong, and I was deep into whatever I was working on at the time, compositionally, and I kind of dismissed it. Not, I just wasn't ready to absorb. Briefly after that, that... And a videotape shows up, and it's Mark Romanek's video of, of the song. Mm -hmm. And when we watched that, that's when the full impact of... Uh, that was a real important moment for me. I um, bet. I was feeling pretty insecure about myself and what I was working on at the time. And when that played, I thought, what, a, what an amazingly powerful thing music can be. You know, right. I, I remember where I was when I wrote those words and oh. how I felt and what a personal, intimate, quiet, written small in a journal those mm -hmm. words were. And to hear them juxtaposed against the life of this icon sung so you know beautifully and, and emotionally, it was a very conscious reminder of what a beautiful medium music is. You know, how, how transcendent and important and just human. I needed that at that time. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. If you guys have suggestions for stories you'd like to see me cover, email. send me an email at gnrcentralnews at gmail.com. Take care.